Hello and welcome to the five methods for security testing your code on the cheap part one. This is going to be a five part series. I'm going to go through different methods of testing your code, testing your software, how you can do it for free or as close to free as possible. Uh, each section I'm going to go through is going to have a brief video that describes that specific section and then I'm going to walk through a couple scenarios so you can see how to actually apply this and then give a brief text-based overview of where uh, where this applies, what it is, and then where you can find some more information on it. So for today we're going to be covering use cases and misuse cases. We're going to go through what is a use case, what is a misuse case, and then how do I use them to make my software more secure. Now there's a million different ways to do use cases. Uh, you'll notice in here I just did something very basic. This is when I have use cases and what a use case is is basically it's demonstrating the actor which can be a system or a person that does something to another system. Now in a full-blown UML use case you would have uh, all sorts of different things on here. You would label what the actor's doing, what he's interfacing with, all the systems would go back and forth across boundaries. But this is a really simple use case. What we're essentially saying here is that this guy is going to buy some fruit. He is going to weigh some fruit on the scale over by the fruit stand and he's going to record that number and say, oh, I got 10 pounds of fruit. He's going to put it in a bag and then he's going to go over the cash register and enter the fruit's weight. Now this guy's a trusting guy that we can trust and he's, he's a trusted actor. So he's a good guy. So he puts in 10 pounds and then he buys the fruit. Well, in the case of a misuse case, we still got our good guy in green, but now we've got our bad actor in gray. Don't ask me why it's in gray. Vizio doesn't let me <laughs> change very many colors. So gray is going to be our bad actor in this case. So our good guy right here is still weighing his fruit, putting it in the bag, entering the fruit's weight, and then buying the fruit. Well, in this case, our bad actor, he's just bypassing all this. He's saying his fruit is mystical, it weighs nothing, and he's essentially getting free fruit. So what we were able to do here is we were able to take our process, and we were able to visually show how this could be bypassed. So if this is a big enough issue, we would put in what's called a control. Now a control is a method to take care of this vulnerability that he is exploiting right here, which is bypassing the weighing. Now the reason I use this example is think about authentication. If you're able to bypass authentication, um, this is kind of what it would show. It's expecting you to do something in a specific step this is where you're going and you're actually bypassing the logic flow and he's bypassing that to get around it so we would put a control in maybe we put a scale at the cash register so even if he tries to say that there's no weight the scale is going to validate that just like we would validate uh, credentials and would make sure that he gets the weight and then he actually pays for the fruit now, on this next slide, what I'm doing is I wrote some pseudocode. So, yeah, this is ugly, but hey, it's pseudocode, so suck it up or don't watch the video. Alright, um, username, I'm saying it's null, password is null. I created this function, I said, alright, this function login is going to take username and password, right? It's going to prompt for the username, it's going to prompt for the password. Then it's going to check the username against the database. It's going to say if the username exists, and if the password matches that username password, then it's going to authenticate. Else if the password does not match, then it's going to say, hey, the password doesn't match. If the username does not exist, it's going to say, hey, the username does not exist. This is another common issue that you'll see in some software um, where people go and they write verbose uh, error code and they don't ever change it. Maybe they're using it during prototyping or testing just so they can see what's going on but they don't change the error code. Well in this case the good guy comes in and he logs in he either gets authenticated or uh, he gets the error and he says oh crap I typed my username wrong so he relogs in. Well the bad guy 
he comes along and he says, oh, username doesn't exist. Okay, well, I'm going to take this uh, dictionary file that has a bunch of usernames in it, and I'm going to go and say, okay, username 1, username 2, username 3, until he gets an error that says the password does not match. Then he knows he's got a username. And then he can just start to work through that list of usernames and work through the password. That's called inference. He's using the error to infer something exists. So that is also called verbose error messaging. So if we go back to our code, how could we fix that? Well, a couple things. First things, we could go and enter some code in here that would say something to the effect of if you were to log in, and actually I am going to try to use uh, my new bamboo writing tablet here. This could go really ugly, so I'm going to pause the video, but uh, hey, it'll be interesting. Now I'm going to just tell you guys something right off the bat. If you come here watching my videos and expecting to see really great artistic talent, um, I'm just going to let you off the hook right now. You're not going to see it. I'm not going to have a marketing department that supports me that gives me flying graphics and kind of craziness you will leave knowing stuff you will leave learning stuff and hopefully you'll learn in a way that makes sense and isn't some crazy PhD spouting off words you can't find in a dictionary um, you will leave learning how this stuff works but you're not gonna get pretty graphics so either accept it or just don't watch the video alright so as we were saying um, I've got this new little tablet thing here that I bought and we are gonna try to make it work and it could be absolutely disastrous so with that being said here we go I will get my pencil alright so as I said we can do a couple different things so right here at the login point this can be a trust boundary right right here so what we can do is we can look at the session ID of this user and this user and we can then go and write some code that would in effect say if this user tries to log on during a certain amount of time then what's going to happen is it's going to look at that session and say the session tried to log on five times in five minutes so it's gonna lock that session drop that session whatever block that IP address etc alright what else we can do is we can go over here and we can use generic password messages so we can actually consolidate these two right here oh yeah look at that that was a rectangle for those of you who don't know geometry <laughs> and, uh, so we could take username and password and we could say that the username and password errors they go bye bye and we just have a generic error that says um, please try to log in again alright so we've got that so we could effectively with two little bitty things of code go and fix that so if I were to go over here back into this code I could go and say essentially um, you know something like add a variable called session ID and I'm really breaking the single use rule for functions where you know a function should only have one purpose but hey whatever it's pseudocode so we could go in here and we could say you know uh, create you know var ah, gotta love IntelliSense it's awesome var session ID okay I could just set that to null right off the bat and then we could go here and we could say you know var is say get next video I'm gonna turn off IntelliSense before I do any of this <laughs> get session ID and then we could say okay we got the session ID and we could say something like to the effect of if you know uh, something like login count is greater than five uh, 
drop or just break or granted break is for a switch but you get the point we're basically stopping the function right there else you know then we would just run this whole thing right here we would say else uh, yeah right there then we run this and we could also go here and we could say you know um, you know please try again and then you know please try again here so what we would do here basically is we're saying alright we added in a login count and this would have some counter code and it would have to go and track either session ID or IP ideally both because I mean you don't want someone to just re-authenticate with the same IP and drop the session ID which they can do they can change their session ID depending if your session ID counts predictable that's a whole nother set of issues session hijacking but essentially what we're doing here is we're saying we if our login counts greater than we break else we are able to run this code we display please try again and then from that point we've just added some basic you know um, session management we've added some generic error coding and we have went to this right here and we have effectively gone and help to change this so now this is gone this is gone and we've added an authentication barrier right here alright uh, final point so with this how do you use this well what you do is you look at your your main parts of code so anything if, if you're familiar with the model view control model anything that's a view that's going to be publicly interfaced with is stuff you're going to want to look at what actions can the user take while the user log on, the user can register, reset password, etc. And then you're going to want to take that little snippet of code and you're going to want to visually describe how a normal actor, normal user would use it. Well, the user would log in or the user would hit reset password and then an email would be sent. Well, is there code in your HTML form that would allow a malicious user to go and use this vulnerability right here, find out the username, and then go hit reset and edit the form using maybe like Burp Suite uh, proxy. He captures the form and then he edits that field and says, hey, I'm going to edit that form right there and I'm going to say send it to badguy at badguy.com instead of goodguy at goodguy.com. All right. So I try to keep these under 15 minutes. What you should have learned coming out of this. We covered what a use case is. A use case is a simple model that shows an actor interfacing, creating some actions. We get the use case by looking at our code snippet. We look at who's doing it, what are they doing, the functions are typically the actions, and then the outputs of the functions right here. Okay we looked at what is a misuse case. A misuse case is simply a use case that is being used in a way that it was not intended and in the case of a misuse case we are going to take the vulnerability and we're going to compensate for that with a control. For example in this use case right here we went and added a scale to the checkout. Finally, how do I use them to make my software more secure? So you saw that you're able to go and look at your code snippet and you create use cases for the primary functions that your classes are going to use. So when you're looking at your code, as you're building out your code, as you're saying, okay, these are the primary things, because I read it somewhere, I don't remember, but something about that five to six things a user will typically do on software. Um, there's not usually a bunch of different functions that your typical user will use. Now I know I'm probably going to get corrected on that <laughs> because I'm, I'm already thinking of crazy applications I've used that have hundreds of different things you can do on them. 
but a generic user logging into a website like Amazon, they're going to add something to a basket, they're going to log in, uh, those kind of things. They're not going to go and edit databases. Uh, at least you would hope not. Okay, with that being said, we covered what a use case is, what a misuse case is. You create them for your common use cases. You create the misuse cases. You do this on a whiteboard in a room with uh, different folks. You want to get, you know, a user level person who, you know, how would you use this? You want to get code level people. You you try to get your audience to be as broad as possible because you really don't want a bunch of, you know, similar thought in there. You want ideas. All right. Well, hey, I really appreciate you guys watching this video. Um, I really hope it's useful to you. Uh, if it is, please post in the comments, give me feedback, how can I improve these? If you ask for special effects and flying stars and stuff, um, you're not going to get it. So <laughs> just don't get your hopes up. Um, but any ideas about maybe, you know, giving more code examples or maybe taking some real code and actually walking through it, uh, that's definitely stuff I can do. Just uh, give me feedback, let me know. I appreciate you all watching. Thanks, have a great day.